Rest in peace, Wesley Shepard. All right, so Walter White, nature or nurture? How do you mean? So like, uh, there's this debate going on with Walter White on whether or not he is sort of Heisenberg from the beginning and he just acquires the means to kind of like, like be him in public or if he becomes Heisenberg throughout the course of the show. Hell no. Heisenberg's for sure already there. You think so? Oh, yes. Yes. I might have to disagree with that. I think Heisenberg is always there. He just uh, finally gets the the chance to let him shine. He's got such a like little little man syndrome. He finally gets the chance to be the big dude and throw his weight around, and he does. <laughs> He, but he doesn't until really, really late. Like, he's throwing his weight around to who? Jesse Pinkman? Um, what do you consider really, really late? Like, season... All right, so when he kills Gus. It's not that it's well before that. I think he's doing fucked up shit before that, but I wouldn't say that Walter White is Heisenberg until, like, season four season five like after gus you crazy i don't think so maybe i think from the second he starts rocking that hat and sunglasses <laughs> he's heisenberg that's heisenberg <laughs> whatever man he doesn't he doesn't know what he's doing man he doesn't heisenberg isn't i don't even believe it heisenberg he doesn't he doesn't know what he's doing in the sense of being a drug dealer but I don't know, man. Walter is just too willing to, like, kill people and do all, like, from episode one. He's not, but he's not willing to kill people. They just, he kind of would just keep dying around. I was talking about, like, these first couple, when it comes to Emilio and Crazy Eight, like, it's not easy for him. He doesn't want to do it. He want to do it. Back, he damn near sabotages himself from trying not to do it. Oh, oh, he doesn't have the means yet. All right, if you say so. But neither against Walter White. Life, death, and dope, boys. My name is Indy. I'm joined by Justin. Um, be prepared for spoilers for the entirety of Breaking Bad. Uh, we talk about the whole show, so. If you haven't seen it by now. Uh, we just rewatched episode three of season one and uh, has a really good opening scene. So is that the name of the episode and the bags in the river? Yes, that's a that continues the saying. The second episode, what is it called? Cats in the bag, the cats in the bag. Yeah, remember we were talking about the life <laughs> bags of cats in the river. Yeah, I remember that conversation. <laughs> Women, in this case, the cats are human beings yep life death and dope boys episode three marijuana drama so jesse and walt scrubbing away trying to clean up the dissolved remains of emilio while they're doing that walt's mind starts drifting back to his grad school days picture this walter and a female lab partner in a college classroom breaking down the chemical composition of the human body they come to it that only 99 percent of what makes up a person can be explained chemically. And Walt, he starts thinking like, yo, I gotta be more to a human than just chemicals, you know? I feel like, uh, I don't mean to interrupt them. I feel like that's considerably beyond grad school. I feel like that's like the beginning of gray matter. That chick is, that's, yeah, that that's Gretchen. The, the chick turned yeah. out to be Gretchen that he's in that classroom with. And I don't think that they're in school anymore at this point. I think they are. I will, all right, so, Vince Gilligan uh, confirmed himself that uh, this scene takes place between 1985 and 1989. Okay. Uh, 85 is when the um, when they win the Nobel Prize. So I want to say this is before Grey Matter, but I feel like this is I feel like this is grad school. Like in my in my uh, estimation when i look at it i'm like this man i won a nobel prize while still in school I, it's possible 
while still in grad school, like he has a degree already. So fast forward to the present, Walt stumping a bucket full of bloody mess into the toilet trying to get rid of the evidence. Poor Emilio. I really like this scene. Yeah, me too. The scene is like art. To me. It's a really, yeah, I agree. It's a really good scene. It's like the entire opening credit scene before the, you know, before the title. Yeah, so it's really good. I like it. I think it's one of the best scenes probably in the entire season. Yeah, definitely. And um, so after I finished watching it, you know, I'm looking at like the juxtaposition of uh, what Walter is saying versus what him and Jesse are doing. And there's like this romantic versus cynical like comparison going on when it keeps flashing back between these two scenes. And I'm just like, I gotta know who wrote this. So I went and checked um, the wiki and it turns out that Vince Gilligan wrote this episode. It's episode three and a four episode stretch that he does in season one. Mm -hmm. And he only writes 13 episodes of Breaking Bad entirely. Really? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and four of them are in season one. I think that as far as like season by season, he probably has more episodes in season one than he has any other season. Yeah, sure. If you only did 13. Yeah. I mean, it's right. Cause there's only what? Nine more. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. The end of what? Uh, four or five seasons. And he directed five episodes. Yeah. It's, uh, I didn't realize just how little involvement. Yeah. It's always interesting when you hear stuff like that. It's like this show is created by Vince Gilligan. That's cool. He didn't really uh, <laughs> write or direct much of this show, though. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, yeah, and then this is when it cuts to Crazy A looking. Watching his cousin drip from the ceiling. Yeah, man. This episode is a, a horror movie for poor Crazy A. Poor Domingo. It kind of is. From beginning to end. When you think of it from... His perspective. his perspective from beginning to end, yeah. If you put, like, suspenseful horror movie music and put, like, a, you know, grainy camera filter, this, this is like a grindhouse horror movie. For this <laughs> <horror movie. laughs> With this psychopath dude making them a sandwich with the crust cut off and shit. Like, that's scary. <laughs> they, it's like they, they make sure to not show anything in this episode from Crazy Eight's perspective. Probably outside of that one um, cutaway to him watching the acid drip from the ceiling because if they did switch the point of view from Walter to crazy eight, you would kind of realize like how yeah. terrible this is. Yes. And you have to keep rooting for Walter. Like season one, you have to be on Walter. So you don't. Well, at least from the perspective of the showrunners, I think like they want the audience maybe for first walk, first watch, first watch. Yes. You're supposed to be rooting for Walter, but No, <laughs> no. Walter jumped to that extreme so soon. It's like, I feel like there were steps that maybe they should have considered before. Hey, let's get chemicals to melt this man. Like what? I don't know, man. I would have done everything I could to spin this in a way as Walter. If I was Walter White, I would have done everything I could to spin this in a way where this shit is not my fault. My brother-in-law is in the DEA. He will surely help me somehow. Let's throw all this shit on Jesse, Crazy 8, and Amelia. It would be really easy to manipulate the entire situa situation to where Hank could unknowingly kind of help. He already makes Hank unknowingly do a bunch of shit throughout <laughs> the entire show. So Skyler and Junior holding it down getting their pain game on in the new baby's room, which if you managed to be paying attention during the awkward lazy ass hand job scene all the way back in episode one, um, that's what Skylar asked Walt to do after work, but he collapsed at work and had to go to the hospital, got his cancer diagnosis and probably forgot to paint the baby's room. Yeah, fuck the baby's room, the lung cancer. He didn't tell nobody else that, though. I'm gonna focus on cooking meth for the family now. In, in Skyler's point of view, he just didn't do it. Like, I guess that's he came home late that day in order to just not do it. 
But in that scene, she does say that she would do it herself. And this kind of does show that she would. Pregnant and all. Skylar White, she's a real can-do woman. I mean, she gets characterized so poorly in this series up until, like, later on in the show. I I don't know if she gets characterized poorly. I think it's um, subjective. It is, but my first couple episodes, like, you do not like Scott. I think her traits are just very, they can be seen as very naggy. They can, and especially if you're rooting for the main character. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep my Walter White bias aside because <laughs> he's the main character, <laughs> but. They're both looking out for their family as best they can in their own way, and Skylar is far more effective. I would say so, too. Skylar would have been a better Heisenberg than Heisenberg, in my She is, once she gets involved. She is. Um, so Marie is being all up in the mix, watching the action. Junior's, <laughs> Junior's falling blowing up, so he dips out for a sec. Now here's where it gets real interesting. Skylar trying to hide she thinks Walter smokes weed from her sis is like yo I'm writing this dope story about a character who loved them some marijuana you feel me it's me she asked Marie about is that Ali what she says <laughs> word for word <laughs> word for word so Marie she jumping to conclusions she straight up convinced this junior getting high Skylar trying to set the record straight but Marie ain't buying it not even a little bit she's stuck on her own theories ain't trying to hear nobody out Meanwhile, Jesse on the sneak, slipping into the bathroom and puffing on some of Walt's meth that he'd been dipping off into on the low. Down in the basement, Walt is being mad disrespectful, pouring Emilio's remains down the basement toilet. I eat from poor crazy A. And it's like there are other toilets in the house. We know this. Jesse's pooping in it. Nah, man, Walter is being an asshole. He doesn't realize it. But he, he is really sucking right now. And he's been dicking around too. He's been putting it off since yesterday. As far as the Crazy 8 situation. So Crazy 8 has been chained up down there for two straight days. Like 48 hours. Prisoner. Oh, like I'd be screaming for help all the time. There's no way that there hasn't been like a jogger or... I don't know. I don't know. Well, his throat is off. His lungs are all fucked up. Like when they first got him down there, he could barely... Like he had this raspy ass voice. Yeah, I understand that. And even after two days, like, yeah, his voice clears up, but I, I'm not sure if he'll be able to scream without, like, crazy intense pain. Whatever. Crazy intense pain is better than fucking being chained to this pole. I don't know. It's hard to say what, what could have happened, because we all saw what happened poor to poor Domingo. So now we got Crazy A still chained up to that pipe, spitting facts he's not supposed to know. Homeboy addressing Walt by his name and dropping some personal details about Walt that Jesse must have spilled. And Walter, Walter is naive if he thinks that he has ever had a chance at being completely anonymous throughout. He's about to be, essentially, when he first cooks, he makes the best batch of meth that anyone has ever seen. Walter White was never going to be anonymous. Somebody eventually was going to figure out or start trying to figure out who this dude is who's making the best meth in the world. Walt, he ain't having none of it, dude gets all up in this field, straight up storming upstairs to confront Jesse. But Jesse, he eyes hell, and he ain't letting Walt anywhere near the bathroom. Walt's thirsty though. Man, he busts down the door trying to get in. Scuffle pops off, tug of war for Jesse's bag of meth, and Jesse tosses that bag right out the window. Walter tries to flush it down the toilet. What? He says it's worth like $40,000 worth of meth or something like that. Yeah. He says some big, big number. We'll, we'll find it. But it's a big ass bag of meth, but I don't know how much that shit costs. As much as Walt is motivated by money, um, especially in season one, I'm surprised that that's even an option for him. I agree. Who cares if Jesse smokes a fucking tenth of meth? You have like a quarter pound of that shit right there. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? You just made this dude melt the dude. <laughs> Let him smoke it. Yeah, you... Don't be an asshole. <laughs> uh, Walt chesses Jesse out the bathroom and down the stairs, but starts coughing up a star, struggling to catch his breath. It's like his lung cancer knows he's on some bullshit and chokes him out before he can catch him. 
He barely recovers in time to catch Jesse just as he's about to dip in his ride. Walt, he's still talking about more grinding to be done, more work to handle, but Jesse, he ain't sticking around for that noise. He bounces, pieces out his whip. The coin flip is sacred. No, you still have work to do. <laughs> yeah, where's the lean? I did my part. <laughs> we, we still have work to do. He's like really trying to wiggle his way out of this. Man. It was so Jesse though, because uh, a coin flip is not sacred. And what third one was a coin flip? A coin flip is sacred. No, it isn't. Marie hits up Hank in the middle of a drug bust, all convinced that they got a scared junior straight. Oh, and while they're on the phone, uh, the shoe store clerk that Marie is dealing with, yeah. fucking sucks. Easily, <laughs> easily the worst character in the whole episode. The most unlikable character in the whole series, bro. I hate this chick. Why? She sucks. Like, oh my god. Like, all right. So the way that they treat crime in this show and the people that they have doing the crimes. It's like they can't just have Marie steal, steal some them. shoes. They got to give her a, a person to deal with who's so insufferable that you, you, you're, you're glad that she steals the shoes. And they do this a lot in season one. But like, Try to justify someone's shitty actions. Yeah. So at first, Hank ain't feeling it, but he ends up driving Junior to the Crystal Palace, this janky motel where all the meth heads and prostitutes be chilling. I think it's funny, Junior has no one. Uh, yeah, I love that thing that's from, from, the, from Walt Junior's perspective is like, why are you, why do you bring me here? Why are we talking about cannabis? Uh, okay. Then he calls over a property who's like, oh God, Uncle, hey, <laughs> please don't call this woman over here. Can we go? A peg trying to school Junior talking about how we leads to heavier stuff. Dude even calls over this messed up looking prostitute named Wendy, showing Junior how Matt messed her teeth up. It's nasty, man, because her teeth are fucked up. Hank even threatens to bust Wendy if he catches her working there again. Wendy bounces off, snuggles into a motel room, and ends up getting busy with Jesse. And damn. Ugh, Jesse. He deserves it. Yeah. Wendy though? I, don't, I think go back to the MySpace page. You remember? Wendy's there. Yeah. I'm lean. I think Jesse has known Wendy for the whole time that she has been smoking meth. I still think I also think though that and the entire time that Jesse, Jesse though no like Wendy, she's been a prostitute. You think so? I would say. If if he could say. There's no way to tell. Maybe she didn't start selling curse trying to see Wendy clearly. She's not all met out, and she's probably still a prostitute. When? On his website, on his MySpace. Because there's a bunch of, like, chicks on that MySpace, and they're probably all prostitutes, Justin. I don't know. I'm willing to hold my breath, and maybe maybe Jesse just knows. I just think women who... I just know Jesse can do better. The All the other women that Jesse pulls in the show, like... Jesse can do better than going, hitting up some prostitute in a motel, bro. Let's be real. Every single woman that Jesse dates in Breaking Bad is a junkie addict of some sort or another. And let's be real. Jesse's other two significant others in this show are probably like a hit or two away from selling some coochie too. Like, don't do Wendy like this. <laughs> Don't, Wendy doesn't deserve all. <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. Okay, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. It's like all of Jesse's girlfriends, he dates a heroin addict and another method. And that other method is like, 
say me about it, like dipping on her kid to go smoke meth and shit. Like shit. Yeah, I forgot that she's kind of fucked up too. I thought she- Wendy has it together, in my opinion, compared to the other city. She's got a job. A place of <laughs> thing. Now that grandma's house. Yeah, man. Oh God. Meanwhile, back at Jesse's crib, Walt trying to figure out what to do with Crazy Eight. Dude got a list of pros and cons weighing his options. He's trying to find reasons to spare him, but the only thing in the kill him column is he'll murder your whole fan if you let him go. Walter calls up Skyler acting like he rented late at the car wash, but she already know he been fired. Walter wanna talk about it later, but Skyler says nah. Told him he could stay his whole ass where he at. And you gotta think that Walter had enough time to think of a better lie than I gotta stay at the car wash late. Um, I don't know. Being unsuspecting of the fact that your wife already knows that you quit, that was probably a legitimate excuse that he had used in the past and been like truthful and stuff. That probably wasn't that big of a stretch at the time. Hmm, I wonder. Because like, so the way that I put it together is, I think it's already dark. It's night. Mm-hmm. What could Bogdan have Walt doing so late some bullshit to where it's going to still take him a couple hours to get home? Some bullshit. <laughs> Plus, I mean, he'd go for the overtime. Technically, I guess so. Maybe it's not so bad. I don't think, but... I don't think it's that big of a stretch for this point in the show, this early. Mm. So you think the only reason it falls through is because Skyler knows? Yes, absolutely. To make matters worse, Walt trying to bring Crazy Eight a sandwich, but he straight up collapses on the basement floor, shattering the plate. And the disrespect is real too. Walter is all coughing on the sandwich, like a lot. It's nasty, man. And Crazy Eight just looking at him like, bruh. Yeah, and I'm still talking about this a lot, but I swear the footage of Walt coughing on this sandwich is probably still playing over. He coughs on this man's sandwich for a long time. He can't help it. He's got lung cancer. He can't stop it. <laughs> but, but being that, I just been a uh, crazy eight, and you just that's too uh, bringing me my only meal that I get all day. Something. What is happening? Literally, only thing I get to eat all day is a sandwich with a crust cut off that this man just coughed all all over it. Gotta eat. Skeptical. <laughs> He wakes up after passing out and he spills the beans to Crazy Eight about his lung cancer. Wall starts cleaning up them shattered plate pieces, then bounces to make a second, hopefully less disgusting sandwich. When he returns, he's trying to connect all with Crazy Eight, you know, getting to know the dude, but Crazy Eight ain't having it, saying it won't make killing him any easier. Wall admits he's looking for a reason not to go through with it. Here's where it gets real. Walt busts out a six pack of beer, things start to click between them. Crazy Eight starts talking about his pops, the owner of a local furniture store with them late night commercials. Walt even bought a crib for Junior from the same spot. And when Walt spills that he ain't told his family about the cancer, Crazy Eight figures out Walt's cooking meth to leave them some cash behind. Crazy Eight offers to cut him a check, then straight suggests Walt ain't cut out for murder. He has no idea. Walt, and I looked it up. I think the lower did you really? Because yeah. I'm not looking at that. Like I'm the racking in my head. Like no, he didn't. The lowest estimate is that Walt is, and the way they say it is that Walt is responsible. responsible. Okay, kills or is responsible for the deaths of over 200 people. And I, I don't necessarily, personally, like count the people that he's just responsible. Like the, I'm sure that the numbers for the airplane crash are in there. Oh, yeah, and that's absolutely not... And I, so I don't count that. But even outside of that... The airplane crash, you can't... Yeah, I wouldn't count that for him either, even though that's totally his fault. But the way that connects is so crazy. Like, that's not Walt's fault. Yeah, not not directly, but indirectly. And But even without all that, like, he does... You think it counts the people that Gus kills? Uh, I wouldn't say. I don't know the dude that knifed in the side of the neck. That's Walt's fault. That is Walt's fault. That dude didn't have to die. <laughs> uh, so Walt heads out to grab the key for the bike lock. And Crazy Ape Man, he seemed believe. But then something hits Walt. He starts piecing the broken plate back together and realizes 
there's a big ass murder shaped triangle missing from the shards. Good for him. Crazy A almost made it too. I I feel, I don't know. He probably could have just punched Walt in the chest like in good time and just dipped. For real, or we would have collapsed. <laughs> like, once you found out he has lung cancer, it's like, oh shit, I don't even need this sharp piece of plate. I can just beat this nigga's energy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, oh shit, he's got lung cancer? All right. No. Bet. So this nigga left me out. <laughs> you don't even need this piece of plate. Back downstairs, Crazy Eight standing all quiet like. Walt approaches, signaling him to turn around so he can slip the key in the lock. Walt hesitates, but Crazy Eight softly commands him to unlock it. As he grabs that lock, Walt asks if Crazy Eight is going to stab him with a shard once he's free. Crazy Eight starts wildly stabbing backwards while Walt pulls hard on that lock, choking him out. Crazy Eight manages to stab Walt in the leg a few times, but eventually he breathes his last breath. Walt, tears rolling, apologizes as Crazy Eight meets his end. And that will be Walt. murder number two for Walt. The number one, that's not technically self-defense. And the way that he cries about it, like, you can tell that he feels remorse. Like, he did not want to kill this dude. That's, that's why I feel like... I always just, like, as soon as he opens the basement door, Walter... Um, and he's, he's like all dark with his silhouettes in the doorway. Yeah, like, oh, like a horror movie. Walter, like, when he's about to do some bullshit, I noticed it watching this episode, and he, he carries on throughout the entire show. He gets this, like, it's just Brian Cranston being a great actor. He has this look in his eye when he's about to, he has this, like, look when he's about to do some bullshit. I think I know the look you're talking about. And, like, he, he, he walks into the basement, probably like, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. Like, by the time he gets to the base, he's crying, whatever. He's like, at least a little at peace with this. Yeah. He, is, he, he still has crazy eight all chained up like this. He could have, like, from three feet back, still called him on the, hey, you got that piece of sharp plate. Give me this piece of plate, Dan. Come on. Come on. I was going to let you go. Give you the piece of plate. <laughs> he could have. You're right. Next morning, Jesse rolls up to his crib and peeps that crazy eight ain't in the basement no more. Bike watch is sitting there abandoned. The DEA dudes, they stumble upon Walt and Jesse's cook spot out in the desert. Hank and Gomez, they connect the dots real quick, thinking it was a mobile meth lab that caught fire. But Hank's a really, really good cop. Is he, though? Yes. Yes. I think the Hank's being an idiot, like, his personality mm -hmm. overshadows the fact that he is, like, really good at his job. Think about all the shit that Hank gets into throughout. Hank is, like... Super cop. He's the action he, hero of the show. He is. Hank's really good at his job. He gets into some crazy shit. Damn. He just... Who would suspect that your brother-in-law is over here cooking that until it's literally put right in front of your face? Literally. Nah, not even that. Even that was him kind of connecting the dots on some shit. Yeah, true that. Because who would think back to that one conversation you had about Walt Whitman and... It's like his brain is always on detective mode. Like yes, putting some shit together. But yo, Crazy Eight's wit is still there, and that got Hank wondering. Only for some hidden meth stashed behind the stereo. So, is Crazy Eight the snitch, or was Emilio? I think Emilio was the snitch. No, I think because Emilio is the one who got snitched on. That's how they got. They pulled up to the drug bust based on an informant, and he says. So why that little hair gel shit leave his car? So the snitch was Emilio. So the dude who snitched on, I'm no, sorry, the dude who snitched on Craig Emilio in the first place was Crazy Eight. Yes, because he's talking like he knew him. And, the, and they say something specific that actually I had to rewind it like three times and turn on subtitles. He said, uh, looks like they uh, got our snitch, got our snitch or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what? I didn't think about that, though. Your I had just considered they were talking about Emilio, but it's not Emilio's car. And, right, they know whose car it is. They know whose car it is. They know it's Crazy Eight's car. Crazy Eight's the snitch. On the other side of things, Walt parking his Pontiac Aztec on the freeway shoulder, taking us to a flashback. He and his lab partner chatting about human chemistry, like from the beginning. When he gets back home, we find Skylar straight up sobbing in the bedroom. 
he knows he's got to spill the beans, alluding to his lung cancer diagnosis. So it turns out either way he's screwed. How do you mean? So I'm thinking about Walter White's situation when he first starts in the lab part that he finds. He winds up running into Jesse Pinkman at the drug bust. But, and that's the only reason why Jesse is his partner right now. So I start to think like, you know, if, if Walt hadn't run across Jesse Pinkman that day, if they never crossed paths, then what would Walt have done? Well, probably he would have wound up as a part of uh, Crazy Eight's operation. But Crazy Eight is a snitch. You know that's, what I'm saying? Like, that's the reason you couldn't let him out. He didn't, but he never knows. Like, I don't think Walt ever... I mean, I'll have to watch it because I'm not going to watch the series, but well, I'll have it. I've never watched the series and then recorded and taken notes on every other cell that's not watching it. So, so, you know, if it comes up again, but that all the matter, the whole, as far as I remember, Walt never connects the dots on, oh, Crazy A was a snitch for the DEA. No, I don't think that ever comes up. So thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode of Live Death and Doughboys. You enjoyed watching and listening. Um, thank you. Leave a like. Show your support. Um, also, feel free to leave your comment because we'd like to hear your thoughts, please. Oh, and we're going to be posting the full episodes on Patreon. So support us on Patreon there if you want to see the entire episode, which is going to be like twice as long. Um, remember to subscribe or follow us to stay updated on our latest content. So you can release a new show every week. Your support means the world to us. Sincerely appreciate every single one of you. See you next time. Rest in peace, West.